This is the ILS or localizer approach into runway 30 right at Rocky Mountain Metro in Denver. It's one of the more commonly used approaches into this airport. But even if you've shot this approach once or twice, there are so many details to this approach that you might not have familiarized yourself with everything. Let's dive into some of the finer points here, beginning with this notes section, which is intimidating. We'll take it one point at a time. First, it's telling us that the DME is coming from the BJC VOR. This being an ILS approach, the approach course is based off the localizer signal, which is 111.7, but the DME distances, which mark out where the ball and alike fix is, as well as where the missed approach point is, are based off the BJC VOR, not the localizer. So the next note states that simultaneous reception of both the localizer signal and the BJC DME are required. The next point seems obvious, that DME is required, but it allows for you to not have DME as long as you're in radar contact from ATC, so one or the other is required. The next several notes deal with changes to the minimum section, so let's look at those. First, we deal with what happens when we can't get a local altimeter report. We need to use the nearby Denver International setting. If we do that though, we need to increase our minimums. The decision altitudes, those are the minimums on the ILS approach, go up 82 feet. Notice there are two figures for ILS. One will go to 5881 and another to 6206. The first one has an asterisk, which we'll address in a second. Next, the MDAs will have to come up if we're using the Denver International Altimeter by 100 feet, so all those go up. Now, the visibilities. The ILS visibilities go up an additional 3 eighths of a mile. Visibilities for the non-precision localizer approach, sidestep, and circling only also go up as prescribed in the note. After that, we're going to look at what happens when the Mouser medium intensity approach lighting system is in op. The Mouser looks like this. It has running approach lights leading up to the runway and then runway end identifiers. They allow a visual to be made from further out. So they allow visibility minimums to come down. Without the lights, the minimums must increase. The next few lines of notes say what those raised minimums are. They also say what the minimums should be when both the Mouser is out and the Denver altimeter is being used. So with those out of the way, we get into the last note with the asterisk. It shows that to use the minimums for the ILS that have the asterisk, we need to be able to maintain a climb gradient of at least 240 feet per nautical mile. Contrast this with the standard minimum climb of 200 feet per nautical mile. If we could do the higher climb angle, we're allowed to go down to the lower decision altitude of 5799. Let's follow an approach to see how that looks. Starting at one of the initial approach fixes, NISPR will be at or above 7000, shooting to be at 7000 by the time we intercept the approach course. We turn inbound, intercept the glide slope, and go down. If we can't make the higher climb angle, our decision altitude is 6124 feet. You could see to the right of that number that this is 525 AGL, much higher than an ILS usually takes us down to. Following the glide slope and being higher up, we'll also be further away from the runway, which is why the visibility minimums are higher than you usually see. They're a mile and three eighths. To get the more standard 200 foot AGL decision altitude, which is 5799 MSL with a half mile visibility min, we need to be able to make that better climb gradient as we go missed by climbing straight ahead and then making a right turn to the north. The reason is likely due to the two obstructions just to the left of the runway, especially the one closer into the departure end. At 5,928 feet, it's above where we'll be at that lower decision altitude. So the FAA has determined we need a steeper climb to get above it. There could be other reasons for the requirement, such as the fact that we're flying right towards the beginning of the Rocky Mountains to the west here. Let's go through the approach from the other initial approach fix to the north, rocks. Notice the note at the bottom right saying as it did in the notes section that either radar or GPS is required. We need the GPS to navigate between these fixes here. If we didn't have it, we'd get radar vectored onto final and the controller would identify both the ball and alike fixes since they have the note radar next to them. We're at at least 7,000 feet here, being at exactly that altitude by long. We turn onto the approach course and make it down to minimums. Here's what the airport looks like from there. Recall that there are sidestep minimums. We're lined up with runway 30 right. If we get to the sidestep MDA 6340 and have both runways in sight, we can move over to the left and line up for 30 left, landing on that runway, if authorized by tower. For the missed approach, we have two options. Both of them involve the same fix, hygiene. 
On the normal hold, hydrogen is defined as the intersection of a radial from the GLL VOR and the FQF VOR. FQF is also used for the DME distance. On the alternate, we're still using the GLL VOR, but this time the cross radial is based on the Denver VOR, and we're also using Denver for DME. Let's use the standard procedure. This shows us climbing straight ahead to 6380, then turning right heading 360. We're going to Hygen, and from the direction we're approaching, we'll be doing a direct entry into the hold. These are the more strange aspects of this approach, just to highlight how important a good brief is on this and all the procedures you're doing in IFR flight. Take some time to go through your favorite approaches and see if you can find something you hadn't already seen. And as always, check out Flight Insight Ground Schools to prepare for your check ride and ace your knowledge tests today. Visit the website linked here and in the description.